Welcome to our SIGGRAPH presentation on variable bitrate neural fields. My name is Tawaki, and I'm a research scientist at NVIDIA and a PhD student at the University of Toronto. There is something really exciting happening in the world today. We are seeing a community-wide effort towards massive shared 3D experiences like virtual concerts. The massive scale at which these events need to operate at brings interesting research questions about 3D data transport and streaming. More broadly, we're seeing an advent of distributed graphics workloads where we want to move graphics into the data center where algorithms may be served by multitudes of heterogeneous compute nodes. In these settings, data transfer becomes an important bottleneck. We're also seeing a shift towards edge graphics where we want to stream 3D information over to clients like thin mobile phones and robots. This motivates the broad research question. How do we make the JPEG a 3D content which we can use as a compressed and efficient data transport format? Our work, Variable Bitrate Neural Fields, shows a first step towards this goal. This representation can encode high fidelity 3D scenes in around a half a megabyte and also enables progressive level detail for instant visualization. Before we explain how we enable this, I'll first explain the backdrop behind all of this. Recently, there has been a surge in popularity in something known as neural radiance fields, or more broadly, neural fields. This is a method of representing 3D data using a neural network that takes coordinates as input and outputs some quantity of interest, like in this case, RGB color, and density. Neural radiance fields seem very promising as a first-order data representation for 3D information, but there are a couple of problems. First, they can be relatively large in memory footprint, and perhaps more crucially, they are also slow to render. Why are they slow to render? Neural radiance fields are slow because they require a very large neural network to encode the scene at high fidelity. Over many query points over many rays, this becomes a huge computational burden. There are works which attempt to alleviate this problem by moving the parameters out of the neural network into an auxiliary data structure known as the feature grid. The feature grid stores feature vectors in a spatial data structure from which spatial coordinates are used to interpolate vectors from the grid to be used as an input to a much smaller neural network. This results in a much faster pipeline because tiny neural networks are fast to evaluate, and proper data structure design can make this feature interpolation from a very large structure very fast. But nothing in the world ever comes for free. What are the costs of feature grids? Although feature grids have been shown to be fast and enable high quality reconstructions, they use an order of magnitude more memory than global methods which rely on a single neural network. So how do we fundamentally shift this trade-off curve between size and quality? An interesting related work to consider is the hash grid proposed in Instant NGP. In this work, they do not explicitly store feature vectors on a grid. Instead, they use the XYZ spatial coordinates and use a hash function to generate an integer between 0 and the codebook size. The resulting integer is used to index into the codebook, and a neural network learns to deal with hash collisions. In practice, for good performance, this kind of setup requires multi-resolution grids of large codebooks to minimize collisions. This results in a relatively large memory footprint despite having no grid data structure to manage. In our work, we instead opt to store integer indices on a grid, which are used to index into the codebook. By learning the integers in the optimization process, we can learn to optimally allocate the finite size codebook entries. But there is a problem here, because the indexing operation is non-differentiable, so you can't learn this in a differentiable learning setup. To solve this issue, let's think about why this process is not differentiable. When you query from this grid, you first get an integer to use as the index, and the integers are not differentiable. Instead of thinking of this as an integer, 
We can instead think of this as the binary vector that performs the indexing through the matrix multiplication. This vector, however, is binary, and so the pipeline is still not differentiable. We further replace this binary vector with the max of the continuous floating point values. The max function is not differentiable, but you can use a straight through estimator trick which replaces the backward pass with the gradient of the softmax function to make it differentiable. This allows us to do differentiable index learning. So how well does this work? We see that at a roughly equal size comparison, our learned indices result in much better reconstructions compared to a hash grid, despite using a significantly smaller codebook. Surprisingly, we find that we only need a codebook of 16 features to reconstruct this model. Here are some more quantitative results. We see here that although we get away with smaller codebooks, we incur significant costs in having to store indices. Here's a comparison against an uncompressed feature grid reconstruction. We incur around a 1 PSNR de degradation in quality, but in return for close to 100x less memory. Here's an animated video which shows some more comparisons. We also show that our method performs better than doing traditional signal compression as a post-process. As baselines, we perform low-rank approximation with PCA, which is similar to what transform codecs like JPEG does. We also compare against vector quantization using k-means, which is the non-end-to-end optimized equivalent to our method. Here, we show some qualitative results that show that vector quantization results in significant loss in the dynamic range of colors at equal size. Here are the bitrate distortion curves that showcase the trade-offs between size in the x-axis and the quality in the y-axis. We see that we are able to shift the trade-off curve as desired. We also enable progressive streaming level of detail, which allows the bitrate of the representation to change as we change the LOD. This is useful in applications like streaming. Before we conclude, I also want to share some weaknesses of our method. If we try our same methods not on radiance fields, but on sign distance functions that encode geometry, we see that the geometry looks less robust to the compression, at least perceptually. There are also algorithmic weaknesses to our method. To learn indices through soft indexing, we need to store floating point vectors of size 2 to the power of the bit, which can be very expensive during training, especially for large bits. As noted earlier, we also need complex data structures to store the indices. Nonetheless, we think that our work is an important first step towards realizing our goal of creating a JPEG for 3D. There's still a lot of remaining research questions, which we are excited to tackle in the future. Thanks for listening.